Okay, welcome to Cloudflare, everybody. I'm so pleased that you're here. This is the second event of our Real World Serverless event series. We had our first one in San Francisco just last week, and we were so excited to fly over here, both me and Jade and some other Cloudflare employees, and tap into this community here because this is our second largest office. And uh, we also, frankly, love coming here to London to visit and engage with the developer community here. So let me hand this over to Jade, and she'll speak a little bit about Cloudflare, and then we'll Get started with speaker number one. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cloudflare. It's on, yes, okay, cool. Um, how many of you know what Cloudflare is? Oh, that's great. <laughs> I guess I, I guess we can get started. Uh, so yeah, we, we run about 10% of the internet uh, by measured as, me as measured by request. Uh, data centers in 154 places worldwide. And very recently, we launched a serverless platform um, called Cloudflare Workers, which allows you to uh, write code that runs in Cloudflare data centers. You'll be hearing about uh, various things related to that, about uh, practical real world concerns um, and best practices when deploying serverless ap applications. And you'll also be hearing from someone who worked on the integration with the serverless framework uh, all today. So without further ado, who's speaking first, by the way? Henry. Henry, come on up. Henry is our first speaker today. Cool. Let's do it. Cool. Let me bring this up. OK. Great start. Um, so a little bit about myself, real quick. Um, I work at Cloudflare, um, which is, as Jay just said, uh, not a given. Uh, so I work on our go-to-market strategy team, um, basically trying to make sure that our new products, such as Cloudflare Workers, actually are, um, are a success to our business. Um, so in that position, I have like a unique view on both our engineering side as well as our sales side. So this talk is going to be quite high level, um, not very technical as opposed to, as opposed to the following talks. Um, but to those who are quite new to serverless and the entire concept of um, running stuff and functions in the cloud. Uh, this is hopefully going to be interesting for you. Uh, and to those of you who already know all of this, um, I'm going to try and maybe bring up a few ideas that you potentially haven't thought about yet um, that I've been exposed to in the last couple of weeks. So real quick, um, we have an intro um, and a very brief market overview, like apart from Cloudflare, who is doing this kind of stuff, um, and then some opportunities uh, in the serverless space. So. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about buzzwords, so I came up with another one after seeing this uh, tiny uh, comic down here uh, in Latin, because uh, why the hell not? Um, and basically, this just means uh, a man-made cloud, as in a literal cloud uh, that's been built by humans, because um, that's what I'm going to be talking about. And if you, I hope you can all see this, um, if you think about it traditionally, how you run uh, software on the internet, you run it on a server, like uh, a proper machine that's somewhere in a closet or a data center. Um, we just call that on-premise. And one of the companies that I just uh, took out here is Dell. They manufacture those servers, right? Um, and you can buy a server. Um, it's a huge upfront cost. You have to maintain it. Um, you probably have some networking team that has to you know, plug all the cables in, make sure there's electricity, put on the software, basically do literally everything. And if your company scales, you have to buy more of them. And if your company has to scale down, you somehow have to get rid of them or keep paying for them. Um, the cost is per machine, importantly. So some smart people thought, okay, that's really not ideal. Um, that's not a good way of running a business. So what if you're a startup, you can't really afford you know, thousands of dollars on an actual server. Um, so they came up with infrastructure as a service, right? So people literally give you their infrastructure as a service. So that's what DigitalOcean does and several other companies as well. Um, and you just go to those companies and you spin up a virtual machine um, and you're good to go, right? You can run your software there. But you still have to maintain your operating system. You still, still have to install stuff to make sure your program runs, uh, web servers, you know, everything, right? So there's still a lot of stuff you have to maintain. Um, but um, the good thing, and we'll see it here, is, this is built by the hour, right? So you no longer have to worry about having a huge upfront cost, but you can actually just 
scale this by adding um, a new instance for your virtual machine or adding a new server virtually. And that's where Heroku comes in. So if this is a bit much for you and you don't want to you know, maintain your operating system and, and uh, wasteful things like that, you can just use a platform as a service, right? And that's what Heroku does. So you don't actually have to install anything anymore. You just use that platform and you run your code there. Um, and to those of you who are familiar with serverless and running functions uh, in the cloud, this might already look a little bit like serverless, but it's not quite there yet. The important distinction is that this is still built by the hour, right? So even if nobody uses your application and it's just sitting there being idle, you're still paying for this stuff. And that's where functions come in, or functions as a service. Um, and I took out Amazon here again, like for all these vendors, don't think that these are the only people who do this stuff, right? Um, there are a lot of people who do this. I just kind of took out the people who are currently um, sort of dominating the space or who are the first ones to do it. Um, so the important thing with functions is that you're now paying for this per request, right? So you don't have to think about how much RAM your machine is consuming or about any kind of CPU stuff and things like this. You literally just write a function and it does something. This is like, it's a unit of application logic, if that makes sense, right? It's a tiny piece of the logic of your application which represents this function. And then you can have lots of functions um, which represent your overall architecture in the end, right? Um, and of course, these can also all interact with each other, right? I'm not saying that on-premise is evil or that nobody should, everyone should use DigitalOcean and nobody should buy Dell service. Like, sometimes you might have to use one or the other and sometimes you might even use all four, right? Um, it really depends on your specific scenario. And one final one that I just wanted to include here, there's obviously also SaaS, um, which just removes all abstraction layers, right? So you, you don't even have to build any software anymore, like the software is done. You literally just click a button and you have your software. It's finished, you don't have to write any code. It's like the ultimate, um, the ultimate level of abstracting your, your stack, basically. And again, here you don't, you don't pay per request, but you pay per user. So that's just a, as, a, as a side note. So now, where does Cloudflare come in? We're at Cloudflare in the end. Um, and where are all the buzzwords? So there you go. Um, basically, just gonna reiterate this again real quick. We started with the Dell servers, right? Uh, on the left, the on-premise ones. Then we went to virtual machines with DigitalOcean. Um, and then I talked about Amazon and AWS. So if you guys are familiar with AWS Lambda, that's serverless, right? Um, the idea is basically that you just have your function which runs on an Amazon data center. And that's kind of where Cloudflare comes in with uh, another buzzword and an important distinction between serverless and originless. If you run your function on AWS Lambda, it runs in a very specific location somewhere in a data center, which you can choose, right? So you can, for example, say this function runs in London, right? Um, which then also means that every time somebody requests this function to run, that request will be sent to London and back, which takes potentially a lot of time, right? And we can't change the speed of light. So we at Cloudflare thought we would make the serverless framework and basically put it into every one of our Cloudflare edge nodes. Every location uh, where we have a data center can run these functions. So we bring the, the serverless part where we take all of the infrastructure abstraction away and stuff, um, and we add one more thing that you don't have to worry about, which is you don't have to worry about location anymore. So you deploy your code and it runs everywhere in the world instantly. And now we have some more buzzwords down here, um, courtesy of Cisco. So uh, fork computing was a marketing term invented by Cisco, um, mostly related to IoT devices. And you're gonna actually, if you delve into this whole serverless space a bit more, you're gonna hear a lot about IoT. Um, we at Cloudflare don't do that much related to IoT and I kind of wanted to avoid it uh, on purpose first um, because there's so much more that you can do with serverless. Um, but anyway, fog computing was kind of uh, invented, so to speak, or invented by marketing people anyway, uh, in the context of IoT devices where um, Cisco basically said that if you have your IoT devices that send lots of data into your cloud for processing, 
um, that takes a lot of time. So it makes more sense to do some processing on the edge, so to speak, uh, before it gets to the computer, uh, the cloud computer. And that's what they refer to as fog computing. And you can kind of see that all of these terms are more or less interchangeable. Um, but the important part is to remember that we're trying to bring the computation as close as possible to the end user or to the end device. Um, and that's what functions do. And we at Cloudflare typically use the edge to refer to our nodes, so every data center we have. Other people sometimes refer to the edge as um, your actual device, right? So you can run code on your phone, obviously. Um, but, but that just depends on the way you look at it. And again, why are we doing this? Why, are we, why do we care if we are close to the end user? Um, I just brought up this example again because we were talking about IoT. If you have a smart speaker, um, like an Alexa, and you ask Alexa about the weather in London, I'm sure maybe they just have a default response and it says the weather in London is always terrible. Um, but typically, uh, you would ask Alexa, how's the weather in London? And then Alexa would send some kind of request to a cloud server somewhere. That server would then probably send another request to an API, get the weather, return it to the user, um, and they will know that it's raining in London. And basically, the closer we have um, this kind of computational part to the user, the faster they will hear um, how the weather is in London. So it makes sense to have this API request, which asks for the weather, come from somewhere um, in the same location as this device is, right? So if somebody's hosting the cloud application, which asks for the weather in San Francisco, but the user is in London, it makes absolutely no sense to send that request to San Francisco, ask for the weather there, and then return it back to London, right? So with Cloudflare Workers or many other platforms, you can easily implement something like this. Um, and actually, regardless of where you are, um, the code will always return quickly to the user. So we reduce the round trip time. And at the same time, we also reduce cost. So if you think back to our Heroku or our DigitalOcean example, um, if we have a smart speaker in our home, we're probably not constantly talking to it, um, or at least if we are, that would be kind of weird. Um, so we really only want to have want to have an infrastructure cost every time we actually have a request going to that device. So again, that's something that cloud functions solve. And the same thing that I'm talking about here for IoT devices applies to websites as well. So every time I request something on my phone, um, it sends a request somewhere to a server, and I want that request to be fast, and I only want to pay for that request from an infrastructure provider perspective when it actually comes in and not constantly. So if you're completely new to this space, here's a list of some of the major players. Um, as you can see, AWS is kind of dominating the space, um, which is largely because they've been around since uh, 2014. So they were kind of the first ones um, to do functions as a service. Um, and also, they do a lot of other things. So AWS has um, a whole bunch of things that integrate with their uh, function as a service platform building a pretty nice and holistic uh, serverless environment. Um, the important thing to notice here, though, is we're kind of comparing apples to oranges. So if you think back to what I explained previously about the difference between serverless and originless, um, you realize that actually Cloudflare Workers is running everywhere. AWS Lambda is only running in one single location. And that's not to say that Cloudflare Workers is better and that AWS Lambda is worse. That's not the case. They're just different use cases and scenarios in which uh, each of these solutions would make more sense than the other. Um, so we'll see how this develops, um, but it's just something to keep in mind uh, when, you, when you develop your own applications. Um, and now something more, uh, even more abstract. Uh, I hope you can kind of read this. Um, so basically, we have an infrastructure concern and we have a multi-cloud concern. Um, if you move your entire application stack to, let's say, Cloudflare Workers, right? Um, you're going to expect it to never go offline, of course. But that's kind of the same thing you expect from every, every other vendor that you work with. However, inevitably, at some point, you may or may not um, have an outage, right? Like anything could happen. And as you can see, and as you might al already all know, 
people implement secondary CDNs, they implement secondary DNS. What people haven't really thought about yet is how to implement secondary edge computes or secondary functions as a service. What happens if your serverless platform goes offline, right? And I thought about this, and I mean, one solution would be to just put an additional uh, serverless platform in front of it, which then routes the requests to, let's say, AWS Lambda and Google Cloud functions. But then again, you have a third vendor, so you're effectively solving your lock-in by locking yourself in even further. Um, so that's just an interesting challenge I want to leave you with. So um, if you guys come up with a great solution, I don't know, might be, it might be a good business to start at some point. Um, regardless, even if you don't um, try to solve the whole um, secondary edge compute problem, workers is actually, and in general these uh, functions as a service, are a great way of implementing a multi-cloud strategy. Because you can effectively, on every request that you get to your website, route your traffic to a different cloud provider according to different criteria. If you have your content on, let's say, Google Cloud and let's say AWS, um, you can decide on the fly which one is cheaper at this very point uh, in time. And then you route your traffic to AWS because it's five cents less than Google at this time. And then maybe an hour later, or if, if the request actually comes from a different region in the world, you might want to route it to the other data center and so on. So you can implement some pretty interesting um, vendor strategies using serverless computing. And even more opportunities. Um, oh, is this, there we go. Sorry, I almost broke the cable. Um, so let me actually go one in. Um, to those of you who've already had some experience with serverless code that you wrote, you probably did something in these two regions, right? You probably did something that had a fairly minor impact. Um, it may have been a temporary fix, it may have been a permanent fix, but you probably didn't put the future of your business uh, and you didn't bet that on the serverless platform that you were using, right? So maybe you fixed a typo on your site because um, you were too lazy to SSH into your server and to do it properly, um, but then the next day you would actually log in and, and fix the typo, right? So that's a temporary fix with a minor impact. And another example is maybe your... Uh, Maybe your business name is misspelled in some places on your website, like capitalized in a weird way. Um, but it's actually like this is happening across the entire marketing site. So you can't just quickly fix that everywhere. Um, so you just put in a worker, very minor impact, right? We just capitalize the F, doesn't change the world. But we leave it in permanently, right? Because why not? And what I'm increasingly uh, starting to see is people who are using serverless technologies for more of a major impact scenario. So one um, kind of interesting way of using serverless is to actually enable your cloud migration um, or to patch your legacy infrastructure temporarily. Maybe you have an on-premise system um, and you're not happy with it and I don't know, maybe you had some security vulnerabilities and you already plan to migrate to let's say DigitalOcean in the future, but you're not doing it immediately. So in the meantime, you can just use serverless to patch all of your leaks um, and keep your website running for, let's say, half a year. But still, this is pretty critical stuff, right? So if it breaks, um, your business would be in trouble. And also, if you're trusting your, um, your business's reputation or even revenue um, on like a serverless platform, you probably want to use a continuous, uh, continuous deployment or integration uh, tool to do so, right? You don't want to log into some uh, some IDE, uh, some web portal, and maybe make a mistake somewhere and be unable to roll back. And you kind of want to have some additional control here. Um, so actually, Cloudflare recently started supporting the serverless framework as well as Terraform with workers. So that's kind of a step in that direction. And then this is extremely rare, uh, but I think we're going to start seeing this happen a lot more in the future. It's people who basically more or less build the entire application using serverless, right? So for example, they would have their entire marketing site, so the entire uh, public facing part of their website um, in an origin-less architecture. So the, the site does not have a server anymore that it runs on. It completely lives on, for example, Cloudflare's, Cloudflare's Edge service. Um, also mentioned IoT integration here, so for example, if you build a new smart speaker um, and you implement it with serverless, obviously if, if that breaks, that would be a pretty major impact on your business. I also saw an interesting uh, case study by AWS Lambda 
um, on Netflix. So Netflix does some of their media and coding using serverless technology. And you all know Netflix, if something like this breaks, it has a major impact on the business. And at Cloudflare, we're seeing more and more people um, with a similar setup whereby everything they do kind of hinges on the fact that our workers are delivering their content fast and, and securely. And um, what I found kind of interesting is that this is becoming a skill, right? People put this on their LinkedIn profiles. Um, I would almost bet that somebody here um, may be an expert on serverless and maybe put something like that on their profile. So obviously, not, not only do people have this in their skill set, but also in their job titles. Um, if somebody here I randomly pick out uh, attends in this audience, I would love to meet them. Uh, if, if that happened by coincidence, that would be great. But the point is basically, this is a job description, right? So this is, this is no longer just an abstract kind of thing that people talk about and it's, um, I intentionally started with the buzzwords, right? So it looks like something really abstract that nobody really actually knows what it is, but not like people make a living doing this. And uh, I kind of got the inspiration to search for this in the first place um, because uh, we at Cloudflare saw this job posting where somebody literally searched for somebody who's proficient at writing AWS Lambda code and, uh, and Cloudflare workers code, right? So this is, this is a skill set that you may want to develop in the future if you don't already have it. And uh, with that, uh, I'm going to leave you to the actual experts uh, who know how to write this stuff um, and stop talking about it in a high level way because it is in fact not magic, uh, it works and we're at Cloudflare already doing it. Thank you so much. Okay, all the way from San Francisco, Steven Pinkerton. Hey everyone, thanks for being here. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, heads up, I'm very jet lagged. We're gonna try to get through this together. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about real world serverless. So I'm a product manager at Cloudflare uh, and I work on some products kind of adjacent to workers. Um, some things in the makes, uh, some things in the works uh, and something we actually shipped uh, last week that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, before this job, uh, I worked in a couple of different engineering capacities in embedded software, distributed systems. Um, if you have a Monzo card, I worked at Monzo. Um, yeah, so something that we, oh, we'll get to it. Um, so we'll talk about kind of what is serverless, we'll go into why it might be useful for you um, for side projects or for your business, um, and then how you can get started using it and kind of where we see serverless right now and where we see it going in the future. Um, so what is it? And so. Serverless is really a way to build applications and write code in a way that doesn't need to be concerned about the underlying infrastructure on which it runs. So you really get to express what your product does um, in the most concise way possible without worrying about how you're actually going to deliver that experience to customers. Um, and so we have a product that, um, we, we have a, a, a serverless product, oh, the screen is silly. Um, and uh, we built an integration with the open source uh, serverless framework, uh, which is a really convenient way to write um, platform independent code that you can deploy to different cloud providers. And our um, serverless offering um, called Cloudflare Workers is now integrated with it. And so it's a really convenient way to deploy code, manage configuration within version control, um, which uh, was previously impossible. So you can sort of manage your entire application with a team, deploy it really easily. Um, it makes testing much easier. It's very cool. I re recommend checking it out. How many people use the serverless open source framework? That's cool. Okay, awesome. Thank you for coming. Um, okay, so why, why does serverless make sense? Um, and so we'll, we'll take a step back and talk about kind of the history of, we can talk about the history of computing or the history of getting paged. So a while ago, and depending on, on your needs as someone who like maybe writes code, um, you used to write applications that would run on your own hardware. You'd buy computers, you'd put them in a data center or in a room, uh, or you'd co-locate co these computers in someone else's data center, and uh, you'd have to worry about networking, you'd have to worry about configuration management, uh, how you deploy code, how you secure all these networking. It was all very complicated. And if something went wrong, if a cat or a person tripped over a networking cable, you got paged, and it was your fault, and you had to fix it. Um, and now we live kind of in the cloud era. I'm sorry for saying cloud era, but uh, we live in an era now where code runs isolated, your applications run isolated from each other, um, you, and you can run these applications in a way that you maybe rent time on serverless providers, you maybe uh, 
rent time in terms of like microseconds or milliseconds if you're renting specifically CPU time on a serverless provider. Um, and so all this is really analogous to you need somewhere to live. And you can build your own house. You can buy a pre-built house. Um, you can rent an apartment. You can buy an apartment. Uh, you can stay in a hotel. And it really depends on what your needs are. If you're trying to stay somewhere, if you need somewhere to live every night of the year, or if you just need somewhere to stay for a couple of nights. Your requirements are different, and the same is for the same applies to your application. And a lot of people have different opinions about where the internet is going, and we really see it as how do we, how do you get code running as close to your customers as possible? And one one way that people are thinking about this this might be possible is some sort of mobile edge where your code is actually running in a data center or on servers at cell towers that are within maybe a couple of miles of, of where people's uh, handheld devices are. Um, so serverless really makes you ask the question of like, what business are you in? And so this really comes down to how do you add value to your customers? And what do your customers care for? And how do you add value to them? And so do you add value to your customers with technologies like this? Do your customers care that you run Nginx or that you have a really cool Redis setup um, or that you use microservices in etcd and Linkerd and some sort of crazy infrastructure? Or do they care about the experiences that you're delivering to them? And Serverless really makes you ask that question and realize that these, your customer doesn't care about these things and maybe, maybe you shouldn't as well and that you could free up your time and your resources um, by instead of architecting your applications in a way that doesn't need to be concerned for these. And your job, I'm guessing if you work in tech or you work in a technical compa capacity, you can distill your um, job description down to something like this where you're trying to deliver some experience to some person in some part of the world really fast. And so why does this matter? Um, you might have heard of the famous um, AWS statistic that 100 milliseconds of latency is 1% of revenue. And that's an important number to, to remember because maybe it makes sense to focus on that and not how cool your infrastructure is. And, uh, and basically who you can pass the pager to, who you want to be accountable. Do you want someone who's an expert at managing servers to be accountable for running your servers? Um, or do you want to do it yourself in addition to delivering an experience for your customers? Um, something interesting, I hope you noticed about this slide, is that most of the world doesn't see the internet through windows that look like this. Um, devices used around the world generally don't look like an iPhone or a Mac. Um, people use all sorts of devices. And so the experience you deliver to them is really what matters. And so serverless is a really powerful tool for expressing your business logic to your customers. And it really just lets you focus on the product that you're going to deliver. And so this really means that you should focus on building products and delivering value and less on infrastructure. And, and what can you do to do the minimal amount of work to provide the most value to your customers? And, and basically, where is your focus? Um, and this really applies to someone building a, a personal project or if you're working at a large company. And uh, as an engineer, you should be afraid of a couple things. As an engineer, you should probably be afraid of code. You should be afraid of infrastructure um, because everything that can break will break. And everything is a liability. Uh, and so this goes back to kind of who can you pass the pager to um, to solve these problems for you? Because I would much rather have um, a larger company manage servers, configuration management, networking, um, than someone like me. And I'd much rather not figure out how to co-locate a computer in a data center um, you know, near my house. I, I don't think that really makes sense. Um, and uh, so who can you pass the pager to in these, in these um, problems? And it really comes down to paying someone else to solve hard problems for you so that you can focus on your customers. Um, and of course, this comes with an asterisk where this really isn't, serverless isn't a one-size-fits-all solution. And with engineering, everything is complex. And you probably have existing applications, so you can't go serverless um, tomorrow. Um, and there are cases when it makes sense for the experience you're delivering to your customers to build your own um, caching layers and, and manage your own infrastructure. So we'll talk about sort of the current state of serverless, how you can get started with it, um, and then where we see serverless going. Nope. OK. Um, so first-gen serverless is really an adaptation of the current model of computing, where you maybe rent compute time by the hour, you're leasing CPU time on someone else's servers. Um, 
And it really comes to standardizing a couple pieces of technology that all of that relies on. So serverless really relies on containers that are running your application and running web servers. And so one problem that we have that um, has come up a lot, and you, you've probably heard about, is the cold start problem. That's really a result of web servers not being optimized for um, spinning up really quickly to deliver requests on demand. Um, it also relies on the model of regional deployment, where you have to pick where your application is going to be deployed. And distributing your application is a very difficult concern for someone who's a developer and someone who's, who's managing data. Um, but all in all, like the current generation of serverless is really, really powerful. And it's let people focus on like the real problems that matter to their customers. It's let, like right now, you can go write code and deploy it and let people interact with it without worrying about chef or puppet configuration without worrying about networking um, or like a lot of very hard problems that are time consuming and people have solved many, many times. So it's, it's gotten us really far, but it, it really relies on the previous generation of computing. And something that goes along with this previous generation is just complex billing um, that many of you may have experienced if, if you use serverless technologies. Can anyone tell me what this number is? So, this is the number of ways in which you can be billed for using AWS Lambda. So you may have heard that serverless it can be expensive depending on what cloud provider you're using and your use case. Um, it can also be complex. You're running a business and you need to know how much it's going to cost to run your application. And all, a lot of these services are usage based. So you don't get a bill until the end of the month. And if your application or your project gets on the front page of Hacker News, if you experience spikes in traffic, you want to be able to predict what you're going to be paying for this. And I'm sure you've seen the blog post before about people who don't expect the, uh, the insane bills that they might get from a cloud provider. Um, and so we see that these all as sort of problems of, of the current model, um, although it's gotten us very far. So these are kind of our requirements that we see as kind of the next generation of serverless, that you shouldn't be tied down to a region. Deploying your code should be fast. And it should be global. You shouldn't worry about where your, where your code is deployed. Um, and it should be accessible to your customers at low latency without variance in latency as well, um, something that you may see now uh, with uh, web servers needed to be, needing to be um, restarted as you get more requests coming in. And your billing should be predictable. Your billing, your latency, your, um, how your application behaves should all be predictable. So with that in mind, I'll talk a little bit about, about workers. So workers is, a, is our answer to serverless. And it's architected in a very interesting way where we looked at the model of web browsers and how people run backend code right now. And we asked ourselves if things are really being done the right way. So this blank here is really like how your application might run right now, where you run it behind a web server like Apache or Nginx, and someone accesses it in Chrome. But there's some problems with this. It's like. Apache and Nginx aren't designed to be started up, started up at um, on demand to deliver uh, requests in high volume. They they're very good at delivering requests in high volume, but they're not optimized for um, this cold start problem. And and people have been making like very impressive strides on solving this problem, but the whole architecture is just not on uh, on your side. So we looked at the way that web browsers run code, and we thought that that might be an interesting way to let you run applications. And so a web browser executes JavaScript extremely quickly. Um, as soon as it downloads JavaScript, you can start executing it. And uh, in certain browsers and in certain JavaScript runtime implementations, you can start executing JavaScript before you've even downloaded all of it. So we thought, well, what if we take existing technology and standards and let you run code that you would normally think about running in the browser on the server? So there's a service workers API. Um, I won't get into that. If you're interested in learning more about the technology behind this, look up Kenton Varda's talk on YouTube. Um, he is the architect behind all of this. Um, but essentially, there's some assumptions you can make about code that you run in a web browser, where if you have JavaScript running in two tabs, one JavaScript in, in one tab can't modify the state of JavaScript, JavaScript running in the other tab. And that's a really powerful form of isolation that you get. But that also means that tabs are very lightweight, that uh, a lightweight um, concept that like we're all aware of. It's much faster to open a new tab in a browser than it is to open up Chrome every time you want to go to another website, a new, a new instance of Chrome. And the latter is really about analogous to how web servers act right now. You spin up new processes. And so you spin up a new process with containers and everything. And um, 
we really want to think of things as threads, as, as tabs that you're running code in, and the tabs with this code are all running in isolation from each other. So that's what we actually did with workers. So we took the V8 runtime, and we wrote some code on top of it, and we put it across our 150 data centers around the world. And so now you can take JavaScript that you would think about running in the browser and actually run it everywhere. And the benefits you get are crazy. So the, the most, probably the most significant one, if you're concerned about using serverless, is that you're not going to experience the extreme variance and latency that you may be right now with serverless applications, where you hit your application, you, you hit an endpoint running that's running a serverless application, and it might your, your cloud provider may need to go provision a new container for you, start up Nginx, and then start up your application. And you know there are benefits to this model, but you're going to be paying for it in latency. Um, and it's interesting because the ideal of serverless is really that you should be paying for what you use. But this really isn't what's happening. If you have a high demand serverless application with a lot of requests, you might have noticed or heard other people doing this where you have a cron job that consistently makes requests to your serverless application to keep it awake and to keep it from, to keep the, your cloud provider from removing some of those containers and sort of scaling your, your application back. So you're no longer actually paying for just what you use. You're paying an extra amount just to keep your application awake. Um, and you may have seen some other breakdowns as well that people have done where um, they've modeled latency in their application. And it turns out late, like optimizing latency in a serverless application isn't the same as you might do in a traditional application. So all of a sudden, you're optimizing the way your code is run on a serverless provider. But the whole point of using a serverless framework what would be to not worry about these problems and to let someone who's more qualified solve these problems for you. Um, another very interesting model around uh, what we've been doing is you get to treat this entire network of code that you deploy your code across all these data centers around the world and that you no longer have to worry about thinking about this as some big distributed application or distributed network. And it's really a single computer that you can think about as, as running your code. And you can reduce it further. It's a single function running your code. It's even a, it's like the, the fundamental unit here is, is an event that happens in your application. Um, and I also recommend Kenton Varda's talk. He, he goes into a lot of detail about this. It's, it's a completely new way to write code that we've seen our customers do very powerful things with. And um, I mean, on top of this, um, if you deploy serverless applications, you may complain that deployments take a long time on some cloud providers. They can be up to 30 minutes to globally to deploy your application. Even if you're using a regional model where you need to specify what regions your code is going to, and you shouldn't be concerned about what region your code is, is being deployed to. Like a deploy should be global, it should be fast. Your code should start up fast. Your code should scale quickly as your request volume increases. Um, and pricing should be predictable. You should have a solid idea of the variables that are being used to charge you for pricing um, or to charge you for your application. Um, and this is all stuff that we've learned from talking to our customers. We've seen them use serverless applications for different things and, and come to us with questions about our, our other offerings, but also with workers of like, how, how do I make serverless work for me? Like people see the benefit of it, but sometimes like the first generation of it is just complex and it can be expensive. Um, and so something interesting that we've achieved with this and the, the data really speaks is that um, the cold startup time for the average worker is about five milliseconds. And so that's for any workload. You could go deploy a worker. It could get on Hacker News in a minute, and your code will scale in a predictable, fast way. Um, so I want to make another plug for um, this integration that we made with the serverless framework. I definitely rec recommend checking it out, especially if you use um, workers already. It's a really easy way to manage your code with them, store everything in version control. Um, there's some great documentation on it. I highly recommend it. I um, just want to make a shout out to the engineers, um, Avery and Nervik, uh, Cloudflare, who worked on this. Um, it's something that we're really proud of, and we actually did this talk last week in San Francisco as well, um, in coordination with the serverless team in San Francisco. Um, it's been really fun to work on. Hi, um, I'm Shevki. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Cloudflare, and if you guys haven't had enough of this, we're going to talk about APIs and how that sort of relates to edge computing. Um, I have a I have a very not so secret motive uh, for giving this talk. I want to change your mind about mindset about how you guys think how everyone thinks APIs should work. So, not to go over this over and over again, but um, 
this is what servers used to look like when I was growing up. It was a server sort of in the back room or utility closet where cleaning supplies were. Uh, and then we went to this, uh, which I believe Google and Amazon just built these so they can put this on uh, Reddit uh, cable porn subreddit. Uh, makes for an amazing picture. Um, but you don't really care where your servers server is running. It's just one of those machines. I think uh, the CTO of uh, Netflix at some point said uh, they were asking him, why are you guys using SSDs? And he famously said, I'm not running SSDs. I only care about performance. Amazon is running the SSDs. Whenever one fails, they swap it out. They put it back in. I don't care. Right? And the future of uh, computing even looks even more uh, abstracted away from us, where we don't really have to care about what operating system we're running on. We just care about the fact that we're running some sort of JavaScript code or Python code or something like that. And we are abstracting away all the operating system stuff that's related to it. So if someone said, your Lambda code or your worker script is running on OpenBSD instead of Linux, would you care? I, I probably would not. And that's kind of the place where we want to go. We don't want to think about, OK, this is the kernel patch that I'm running, and blah, 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 or this operating system I'm uh, currently running, or the vulnerabilities or whatnot. We really want to only care about the code that we're deploying and nothing else. But in the end, not to belabor the point, but we went from a server in the utilities closet to a server running in US East 1B to no computers. But it's still one location that it runs on. And I really want you guys to think about why code running on Cloudflare workers being very global is interesting. Right? So edge, when we say edge computing, edge in edge computing refers to the edge of the cloud. So it is the closest thing, closest computing units that are available to your users, with the exception of the ones that they're looking at when they're running into each other on the tube station. And that is a really, really important thing for you guys to think about. What is the latency when someone refreshes their Twitter feed? What happens then? What happens when they're swiping on Tinder? How fast it is? So Matthew, um, our CEO, very, uh, I was going to say very famous, but it's apparently not that famous, uh, said, uh, we're not there yet, but what we want to do <laughs> is get to 10 milliseconds of 99% of the global population. So anywhere you might have a user, anywhere you might have someone eyeballs that you want to attract, where latency matters, we want for the 99% of them, we want to be within 10 milliseconds. That is really, really important for us that we are closer to your users than to your origin servers. Now, we sort of think about all this interaction between our users and our servers, but in all honesty, it's probably a little bit, bit more like this. And we probably want to be here, right? We don't want to be close to your server. We want to be close to your user. And that really matters to us because we really care about performance. One of our colleagues, uh, Zach, uh, made a comparison of performance between workers, Lambda, and Lambda at the edge. And this is Ken, uh, the architect of workers, channeling uh, Rita, who's the program manager for uh, workers. We really, really blew them out of the water. Like, we're really fast. But 
we still have this mindset that, okay, what are things that are cacheable? What are things that we want to put behind Cloudflare or a CDN? And what are things we don't want to put behind the CDN? So we probably do something like in our CI CD pipelines, bundle JavaScript images, uh, CSS files, we put hashes be uh, after them. So we know that they're cached and whatever. So we can, when we're downloading them, we know the correct version that we're downloading. There are libraries upon libraries built for this exact same reason. So we can cache these things. But we don't really think about API calls as being cached. Like uh, Jade mentioned earlier, where now all these things like machine learning and whatnot are becoming very, very popular. We're not really thinking about the cost of, okay, how much is it going to cost me to make another uh, translation request to uh, Watson? How much is it going to cost me if I make a request to Google's uh, image recognition service? We're not really thinking about those things, but more and more people are actually uh, looking for those stuff. We really want to be able to, at the edge, when someone, before someone is uh, uploading something, we want to be able to do boost detection. We want to be able to figure out if an image, a particular image that is being uploaded to our website is copyrighted material. So we can stop it before it hits and becomes a extra cost for our support staff to deal with the abuse claim, deal with the takedown notice, or so on and so forth, right? So we don't really think about those things as being cacheable, but I, I, we think they are. We think authenticated pages should be put behind uh, Cloudflare, admin tools, and we certainly do this internally. Like, all our API calls are behind Cloudflare. All our admin tools and whatnot, we put behind Cloudflare, and there are reasons for this. And due restricted content, like how many, uh, when the GDPR thing hit, how many US-based websites just went uh, offline for the entire Europe, European regions, and they're using things like Cloudflare and whatnot to go, okay, this is coming from, uh, the origin is such and such country, we're going to block it. it. We're now starting to think about these things and service endpoints as well. So you don't really have to think about workers as being a independent platform on its own, but it can be complementary to all these things that already exist, like Google Cloud function, Azure functions, or Lambda or something like that, or uh, IBM's Watson or hosted services like that. So this is, this is our map of, this is one of the uh, curses of working for Cloudflare is that the number of data centers update so much that we have to make these maps interactive so we can download the list of pops and actually this doesn't really look right um does anybody have yeah <laughs> i think we should make those orange so uh he said setting up his first demo right um So what is our uh, official orange for workers? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should probably know this. But yeah, let's check if that's right. That looks about right. And let's see how fast that actual script is deploying. That's how fast worker scripts deploy. No need to applaud for that. <laughs> right, so that is the global, global map of how many pops we have, uh, points of presence, uh, and literally just as I click save, it goes in and uploads it everywhere. It is really, really fast. And it is extremely gratifying to be able to push code. And then it's deployed in seconds. I think our current max top uh, limit for 
how long it'll take is about 30 seconds, but I've never seen anything take that long. Uh, I think it's just something we say to basically cover ourselves, but it really doesn't uh, take that long. Okay. Okay, so uh, what does all this have to do with GraphQL and this entire thing I was uh, telling you about? And certainly Henry and Stephen talked about this as well, where we really, really want these experiences to be very as performant as it, as it can be. So if I go back to this, right, what we really want to be doing is, because there are these things from Cloudflare's uh, origin, uh, Cloudflare's edge to your origin, we can do a lot of things like do Argo Tunnel and whatnot to make your, and do smart routing and whatnot. And because we have this global network, we can route your requests from the Orange Cloud to your origin servers very, very fast. What we, what we really want to be able to do is, we want to be able to get this distance as short as possible as well because this really matters, right? So if the round trip doesn't have to go all the way to your origin servers, that's a win. That's a win because your your server is going to be uh, have uh, your server is going to have less load. This person's battery is not going to die because it, they're waiting on a HTTP connection to close and many of those add up. So we re really, really want to be able to fast. And one of the ways that uh, some folks at Facebook uh, some time ago, I think around 2015, figured out how to do this is by batching a bunch of these calls so you don't have to open a, uh, a new socket for every single call you make and then incur the cost of doing a TLS handshake, a TCP handshake and whatnot. And you just complete all those at one go. And that is called GraphQL. So here is what uh, GraphQL uh, looks like. Uh, or this is graphical, uh, the GraphQL uh, editor that the GraphQL team built. And let's actually try to write a query. I'm going to put this microphone down for a bit. I hope it doesn't make a huge thunk sound. So notice as I'm typing, and this is one of the great things about GraphQL, is that you get autocomplete. Because your uh, entire API is defined in a schema, it also gives you hints about what you need to put in and what not to put in. So what we're going to do is, this is a GraphQL server that I wrote on top of our 1.1.1.1 uh, APIs, which resolves uh, DNS queries and returns us the data for it. So we're going to put the name, let's make that, uh, let's keep that in the company called Cloudflare. Then we're going to put the type in, autocomplete, thank you very much. And then we'll do quad A. And then we get all the fields that we want filled in automatically. Now, this is great. Uh, but what, what is really also great about this pattern is that you can shape your data without changing the server-side code. Uh, and that gives you the ability to iterate quickly. So if you're writing a mobile application, you don't have to raise a ticket to get the backend folks to change what the resulting data shape that you want to look like. You can just change it yourself and do interesting things. So if I wanted to maybe get rid of the TTL and get rid of the name, and hey, let's get rid of the type as well. And let's prettify that code and run it again. Works. What if I wanted to have multiple of these? Sorry, it's hard typing with one hand. Thank you, Jade. 
So we're going to do, uh, let's do IBM here. Now, I'm getting also errors uh, as I'm typing them. And the reason I'm getting uh, an error here is it says, oh, there's a conflict uh, for uh, resolve because we already have something called resolve. And as you can see on this side, this is the field that we return in our data object. So what we're going to do is we're going to call this um, IBM and do this. And then we're going to call this CF and do that. And is this an error? Not really. IBM doesn't have a quad A record. They're not IPv6 yet. Shame on them. And if I do uh, IPv4, go old school, that comes back. Thank you, Jade. So one of the uh, interesting things, uh, as you can see, is we can, uh, these are separate, uh, and I'm going to go into the code uh, in a bit, but these are separate uh, API queries that we're bunching together, and we're doing them on the server side. Now, the great thing about this is I am going to go into the dev console. Let's look at our network. Uh, everyone okay? Right. So as we can see, we're doing uh, two different uh, resolutions on our end. And we're getting 47, 12, 24, 17, 22 milliseconds for not that small of a, a query that we're doing. Well, if we wanted to actually multiply these, so add more, let's call this MS and make it. Who thinks Microsoft has a quad A record? Are they IPv6 or not? Uh, let's see. No! Oh, Microsoft. Bill G. Uh, or we can, let's look at their MX records. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, outlook.com. Uh, yeah, so if we do these uh, over and over again, you will see that all these things are resolving fairly quickly, like 15 milliseconds, 19 milliseconds. And if I keep going, it's going to probably even out somewhere around 10 to 20-ish milliseconds. And the reason for that is we're caching these very, very aggressively on the worker. And let's actually jump into the code that does that. So everyone can read this? Right, all right. So this is our starting point. Uh, and all this code is available. Uh, I'm just going to go through a few points of these. Uh, but all this code is available on GitHub. And you can go and play with it. And I encourage you to play with it. Because uh, uh, if you clone the repo in three uh, simple command, you can build, uh, and when I say build, bundle your uh, worker script uh, into a single thing and deploy it to cloudflareworkers.com, which is basically, any, if any of you guys are uh, familiar with Repl.it uh, or Go Playground or something like that, this is our playground for workers. So you can go and write scripts. You don't have to sign up. You don't have to do anything. Just go in, uh, put your code in, and it works. So uh, in the in the repo, there are uh, three. I'll just show you the repo. Um, uh, I'll show you the repo later. All right, let's do this first. So basically, uh, first thing uh, we want to do is uh, we're going to uh, decode the code that we get. So. Uh, if you go and look at the GraphQL documentation online, uh, you will see that most of it is set up for doing something like Express or something like that, uh, where you get a you need to set up an HTTP server. Uh, with Cloudflare workers, you just get the request. So with the request, 
we actually register an event. I haven't included it in this slide, but uh, in the full code, uh, this all will make sense. Uh, we handle the GraphQL request uh, that receives an event, which is a fetch event. We're going to decode that query uh, by this is basically very simple uh, boilerplate code that you need to have in the GraphQL implementation of uh, Cloudflare. But I just wanted to put this here uh, to show you that it literally is 100 something lines code to have a fully functional GraphQL server in workers. And I've, when, when GraphQL first came out, I really, really wanted to get into it. And I, I, I want to set up a server. How does, how does that work? I have never found anything as simple as Cloudflare workers to actually get started with GraphQL. Anyways, so we basically do some houseworking, uh, housekeeping. Uh, we uh, get the because these uh, old worker scripts use the standard uh, web uh, APIs. Uh, we basically get a, a body. Uh, we decode it literally by uh, changing UTF binary uh, UTF eight uh, to binary. Uh, sorry, strings. Um, and then we do this one simple thing, uh, which is the only gra uh, only external library that we have in this. It, it, it is the GraphQL uh, resolver. So let's look at the schema first uh, and what a GraphQL schema looks like. So the, the bits that were giving me autocomplete and the enums and whatnot, as you can see, these are the DNS uh, record types uh, that we have defined. And if I go back here and I close this bad boy and open this up and I look at the query, I see resolve, name, string, type, record type, and answer. All these are documented and commented. It's all this code. So we give this gra uh, schema to... Uh, GraphQL and GraphQL knows how to make a, a introspection query out of it, and the introspection uh, queries are also in GraphQL. So you can actually find, for example, GitHub's or Facebook's. Uh, I don't know if Facebook has a public GraphQL API, but uh, you can certainly go to uh, GitHub.com and look at their uh, GraphQL API, and their GraphQL API is defined in GraphQL. And you can literally query through it to write tools and whatnot that you would uh, you may want to use. But this is really the only query that we have for this uh, particular GraphQL uh, uh, code that we have, which is resolve, uh, and it is the exact same signature for the function that we had, and it basically uh, says it needs a uh, name that should be non-nullable uh, and a type, and it will return you a array of answers. And the gql.query bit is the bit that we basically decoded, and from the uh, JSON object that uh, gets posted to our server, we just uh, take out the query bit, and that is the GraphQL query that we send over here. So this is the it that comes out of it's a string that comes out of uh, uh, GQL that query right here. So let's look at um, the new root. What are we doing here? And this is really the interesting bit of uh, GraphQL on workers, or GraphQL anywhere really. So we're passing in this event, and well, why? Uh, we'll get into it in a bit. So we're basically uh, here uh, creating a root object. Uh, this root object has a constructor. Uh, into it, we're passing a uh, event uh, uh, here. So what we're basically the signature for GraphQL, this function. Uh, I should have gone that way. All right. So the signature for this function is basically schema that you have to give it, the query that you have to give it, and then root is optional. But basically, it takes the schema, it takes the query, and it traverses through the query and figures out which fields of the object that you're passing into it to 
sent back to you. So if you take out like we did uh, in this bit, let me just get rid of this. Uh, in this bit, if I put a name, it'll basically say uh, when it's uh, going through the query, it's going to say, hey, I want uh, this thing to be there as well. And voila, that works. Right, so uh, into this uh, object, and this could be a very simple uh, plain old JavaScript object that we're, we're passing in, but we're uh, passing a class, and the reason for that will become uh, clear in a bit. Uh, so this bit uh, is the only field. So this could have been a field. We could have just uh, basically said, instead of having this be an async function, we could have just had a string literal that would be returned from it and that would have worked or it could have been the uh, array of answers uh, answer objects and that would have worked it could have, we could have basically uh, hard coded it but what we're doing it is what we're doing is we're returning a promise for what is to come to this object and that is going to uh, enable us to take all these queries that we have uh, batch them and parallelize them. And as you can see, this uh, resolve sort of has a one-to-one -one mapping with the query uh, as well. So uh, everything that's uh, the X object that we're, we have here is going to be, uh, is going to have a name and a type. Okay. So let's go back to the event thing. Why are we doing this? So when we're uh, constructing this uh, root object, what we're doing is we're, we're uh, setting a resolvers uh, thing uh, field, and that resolvers is a data loader. And this is one of the uh, patterns that Facebook folks sort of uh, uh, Facebook folks came up with, and they use this very heavily on their uh, backend uh, services. What this does is uh, as you can see, it takes a, a object called uh, keys. We don't know what it is, but we're probably sure it, those are keys. Uh, it has a batch resolver, and data loader does batch resolving by default and doesn't do uh, single resolves. Uh, and there's a very good reason for that as well. Uh, but let's go into that uh, data loader thing and see what it does and more specifically why we're passing this event thing into the batch resolver so in the batch resolver we're just going to take our uh, keys and iterate through them and we're going to resolve them one by one by passing IDs okay this is literally the only thing that actually does any queries outside uh, what we're doing here is we're taking, we're creating a new request. Again, this is all on the Mozilla uh, web API docs uh, page. I think that everyone sort of converged uh, for uh, converged on using MDN as the source of truth for the web APIs. Uh, we're saying uh, this is an application slash uh, DNS JSON uh, request that we're making. We're making it to cloudflaredns.com. Uh, we take the name and we put uh, the type as query strings for this uh, request. Ooh, so this was uh, introduced two days ago. This is the very, very shiny new uh, cache API that we have. Uh, and Rita uh, tweeted about this a bunch and uh, she has a blog post on the uh, blog, uh, blog about how to use these. Uh, and it's really, really cool. So this is the bit uh, that we, we've been talking about where we want you guys to think about, do I really have to make this request to IBM Watson or Google's uh, machine learning service to make this request and get it back in? Oh, I, I have to do it again. Then I have to pay five cents or however much you have to pay for it. No, you don't have to. What you do is you open up your cache, uh, which we have them uh, local to uh, whatever pop you're connected to. Um, then we match it with the request. And this is why I'm basically 
up here, uh, constructing a new request. And I go, if the response is not empty, uh, wait, yeah, if the response is not empty, uh, or empty, really, uh, I want to get this, uh, I want to fetch this. What I then do is, this event bit, this is why I've been sort of propagating uh, the event down, uh, all the way down to here, where I say, event wait until uh, cache put. So what this basically says to um, the worker script is, hey, uh, you can you can keep writing, uh, you can start writing. So if, if I've received all my fetches and maybe six of these uh, requests that are batched together, a couple of them are cached, a couple of them were not, you can start uh, streaming the response back if you have everything you want ready, but I'm going to keep this script working so you can cache all the requests that you've uh, received. So the next time someone comes in, these are all cached. We uh, wait for the response, and then we return it. And that's pretty much all you have to do to get uh, worker uh, GraphQL on workers going. There are a couple of uh, other things that we do. So uh, because the object that we were passing into uh, data loader were uh, objects and not really single uh, strings, what we're doing it is we're basically concatenating two strings to say, this is the type, this is the domain name that I'm getting. Uh, this is going to be the cache key. And then we're basically here saying, um, I'm going to use a, uh, a map object, a simple map object that I have here uh, to use as uh, my uh, in-memory cache. And then what we do is we basically stringify the response and that's our query result. Uh, and that is literally all the code you need to get uh, GraphQL working on uh, Cloudflare workers. That's uh, me. Uh, the demo uh, that I just made, uh, the co uh, website is online here. The code is available on GitHub if you want to go and check that out. And like I promised, uh, literally all you have to do is npm install, npm run build, npm run preview. It literally is like to get this going on a uh, on the Cloudflare workers playground is shorter than my entire talk. And that's it. Uh, any questions? Oh, also, uh, this is where the documentation lives. And if you want to, you can email me at uh, shapek at cloudflare.com and I'm uh, on Twitter and GitHub. Again, I'll now hand it over to our final speaker who has flown here from Madrid to speak, not necessarily on our behalf, but his own behalf about his interesting workers' use cases out in the real world. Uh, Patty Sherry is a workers' expert. So we wanted him to come here and speak this evening. Thank you for coming here, Patty. Hello. Uh, so, uh, briefly about me, um, I work for gambling.com group. Um, I'm a lead developer there, and um, we, oh, it doesn't have the quick switch. Anyway, we are, we operate in the online gambling industry, um, and we do performance marketing. So, what that means is we uh, create lots of websites that offer reviews of online casinos and uh, present unbiased uh, reviews so people can come on and see um, which casinos are the best and uh, choose one based on their preferences. And um, what we build on a daily basis are a global network of multilingual websites. So we currently have 55 websites online. Another one just went online today and um, they're based all around the world. So the US, Australia, Europe, um, we have m most continents, there's, there's a, a website we're running there. And um, we run everything through Cloudflare. So um, we'll just get on to the, the tech stack. Oh, sorry. So these are some of our sites. Gambling.com, bookies.com, slot source, and casinosource.co.uk. So our tech stack, 
is entirely static websites served by the Cloudflare edge locations. Um, there, there is no processing done on our servers when a user requests a page. Everything is served by Cloudflare at their edge immediately. So um, it basically means that we have an extremely fast collection of websites and we have minimal server costs because Cloudflare is serving everything for us. So it's just a little graphic of basically what happens. We have, uh, obviously, we the, the first request needs to get to a server so Cloudflare can cache it. But after that, every single user, no matter where they are, they're getting served the website from a location close to them. So uh, it just means our platform is, I don't want to say infinitely scalable, but it's uh, it's pretty robust. So the benefits of building our system this way is that it's fast. Um, the, one of the number one things we're concerned with is speed, is getting the, the website loading fast for users. Um, so we factor that into every technical decision we make. And the primary benefit is that we have extremely fast websites. They're also secure, given all of the Cloudflare security features. Um, we, we really don't have to worry too much about that side. Um, they're served from the edge, so there's nothing getting through to our server. Um, we just let Cloudflare handle all of that. And the combination of static HTML and speed is very SEO friendly. And that means we're, we have a somewhat of a head start in trying to rank highly in Google um, because of the technology choices we make. So we do have some limitations then. And the primary one is, is static. So Everything uh, is the same for every user. When someone visits the homepage of a site, it doesn't matter where they're coming from, they all see the same content. And until now, we've, 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 we've been doing okay with that, but we, uh, about one year ago, we decided that we need to start making these things dynamic um, and personalized in order, to, uh, in order to stay ahead of the competition. So that's the, the primary problem that I faced then as the lead developer was trying to find a way to make what are static websites dynamic. So um, initially, I felt we were going to have to totally rebuild our, our platform and, and move to server rendered sites and have servers all over the world or use uh, AWS to try and you know do it efficiently. Um, and for a while, it, it was, you know, we were in an a bit of deep period of research about how we were going to do this. And then we heard about Workers. So we were a Cloudflare customer and we follow the blog and Workers was mentioned and straight away it caught our attention. And uh, we applied to be part of the beta. And uh, as soon as it came out, we started using it, started experimenting it. And very quickly, within a couple of hours, we could see like this is going to solve some problems for us. So given that, we set about trying to do things with workers. And the first one was geo-targeting. So as I said, um, our websites rank very well in Google, um, but usually that is the English version of the site. So one of our websites is gambling.com and the homepage is tailored for a UK audience. So it features UK casinos. But let's say some guy from the US lands on gambling.com, well, that content is of no benefit to him because it's the prices are in pounds, not dollars. And then let's say someone from Italy lands on the site, well, he may not even be able to read it because it's not Italian and the prices are in pounds instead of euros. So we were losing a lot of traffic that was coming to the sites because it wasn't, the content wasn't tailored for what they need. So we tried to solve this with workers. And the way we did it is with Cloudflare, they give you the option of detecting the country of the request. So we just created a simple worker that checks the income and country. It's a two-letter code. If we have a local version of the site, then we offer the user a redirect if they want it. So I'll just give you a little example of what it, like, what it looks like. So on the left is a page that you can see. It's entirely English. Pound currency is pounds. If a guy comes in from Italy, that's of no benefit. But once we deployed workers, we are now able to show a banner at the top of the page, which 
if anyone can't read it, it basically says, we have a local version of the site, would you like to go there? So now when someone comes from another country and lands on our site, we can show them a message, offer them uh, the option of going to a, a more relevant version for them. Um, and the benefits of this is that we're not losing traffic we're, we're, and our bounce rate is, is not going up because people are actually staying on the site when they come. And also users are getting what they want. So we're providing a better user experience via workers. Second use case is restricting access to content. So I know some companies have very uh, high requirements when it comes to security, um, protecting their systems, but sometimes uh, military grade security isn't really required. And I give an example. Um, I, I created a, uh, I submitted a, a guest post on the Cloudflare blog, and while that was still in draft, it was available on the internet. So it was cloudflare.com forward slash p for preview forward slash some random string and uh, the content was nowhere near finished there were spelling mistakes and everything but people were able to access that before it was ready and um, some people actually started linking to that article from within our company because they were uh, they saw that they got mentioned and started promoting it that, that we got mentioned on the cloudflare blog and um, it was it was nowhere near ready so but there it was just open to the public and that's something that we would have occasionally like so let's say for example we have a guest author who contributes an article and maybe we want to just put it online for that guest author to approve before we make it available to the public so what you can do with workers is you can just say if there's a query string uh, if there's a parameter in the URL allow access to the content if it's not there block them so here's what it looks like without workers everyone can access the page with workers we can block people unless they add onto the end of the URL question mark preview equals true so just a simple way of firstly preventing people seeing content before they should and secondly preventing it being crawled by Google before we want it to be crawlable um, and the benefits are that it was extremely simple to implement and it took 10 minutes and it's, it's really easy for other people to understand how they actually need to uh, manipulate the URL to get to the page. Third use case is A-B testing. So we like to experiment with uh, lots of things. Um, like changing layouts and stuff, and we use A-B testing tools to do that. Um, tr there are some very good ones out there, but the problem is there are always a JavaScript that you add to the page. And then once the user loads the, the website for a brief, they can for a moment see the original version, and then the, the variant will snap into place. So it's, I think the correct term is Flickr. So uh, it's a really bad experience uh, in our eyes, and it's something we try hard to prevent, but we still need to A-B test to get the insights that, that it provides. So without workers, users would see something like this. So they would see the original, and then the variant would snap into place. But with work workers, we can detect the response coming in, manipulate the page, load the variant, and send it all back to the user with the variant already in place. So there's no snap. You don't. User is not trying to click on something that is going to disappear afterwards, um, and it's just a much better experience. And we still get all the benefits of A/B testing and the the data that it gathers for us. And then, the final one, which is not something we're doing in production yet, um, but it's something we're working on. So we have this website called FootballScores.com, and as you can imagine, it's, uh, it shows fo live football scores from around the world. And it's currently running, uh, it's a traditional server rendered site. So um, we don't like that because it's not scalable and we really like doing static websites. But with a static website, you know, we can't show live scores. So we're finding a way to make this a static website that is dynamic using workers. Um, so when the user loads the page, the worker script will go off to an API, 
get the score data and bring it back into the page. And when the page loads, the user will see what's on the right. So the scores um, already loaded. Now, of course, we could do this without workers by firing a JavaScript request after the page loads, but then users would see this loading indicator and then the content would snap in. And as I said, we don't like things changing after the page loads. So with workers, we will be able to fetch data from an API, inject it into the page, and users will uh, have it loading incredibly fast because it's a static site and it's served from an edge close to them. Um, so those are our use cases. The roadblocks that workers remove for us is that it allowed us to make our static sites dynamic. Um, and we avoided having to undertake a major architecture change to server rendered sites or some other technology. Um, and it, it solved our problem a lot quicker than we expected. So that's not to say we didn't look at alternatives. So the first one we looked at was Lambda. Um, we investigated that. We also looked at Netlify, which is a, a platform for creating static sites, which actually integrates with Lambda closely, and then the Google and Microsoft offerings. Um, but we found that the implementation of workers was incredibly simple. I mean, in the back end of the, in the Cloudflare dashboard, when the, before they integrated with the serverless framework, you could just click workers, launch, and you get a little window and we, you could be coding in a couple of seconds and finish the worker in 10 minutes and deploy it to your production website with, um, with no problems. Now, obviously, with that uh, flexibility you know, comes great responsibility because you could easily leave a character out of place and take the site down. So we have to be very careful with it, but it does give us the ability to do things very fast. Um, and that's why we went for workers over any of the other offerings out there. So as I said, it's easy to implement at the top of our architecture, no additional cost, something with like $5 a month or something, nothing too major, but also the speed. So um, as from the Cloudflare blog, we can see that it, it, it's faster than Lambda, it's faster than the others. And um, speed is, as I said, one of the number one things we're concerned with. If there's any possible way to save a millisecond, we'll, we'll do that and we'll choose the right tool for the job. So given workers are a recent development, you know, they're not perfect and there are some things that we think would really help them develop and become uh, more of a, a mainstream technology and that's access to more worker scripts within the back end. So right now we can only access one. If we could access multiple, it would be great. You know, having all of the code for a site in one file is, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to navigate. More documentation will be good when that comes. Recipes, so uh, just snippets of code that you can use to do just r regular things without having to write it all from scratch. Integrations with, with other tools. Um, for example, an integration with Google Firebase would be great. So uh, if we wanted to uh, integrate with an API, we have to do that all manually in JavaScript. It would be cool if there are some common uh, tools that people want to integrate with that we could just do that, but with the click of a button. And also, what we would really love to see are databases on the edge. So, uh, with any of our sites, if they need to get data, the worker is still going to have to send a request back to an origin server, which could be on the other side of the world. So the benefit of workers is somewhat lost. So if we could get the database closer to the user without having to have database servers all over the world, uh, I think we would have our sites as fast as they could possibly get. Um, so those are some things that we think would really help along with some extra logging um, so we can see exactly what's going on. So that's it. Um, any questions? <laughs> <laughs>